I'm Jeremy Shuck, and I am the husband of Ashley and the father of five kids, 13, 12, 11, eight, and three years old. And I have the privilege and honor and joy of co-pastoring alongside my wife, Upper Room Frisco. I, I think that I can tell a somewhat clear, cohesive, maybe even concise story uh, that weaves together a little bit of my upbringing and uh, ministry school years and then how I got to Dallas. And the reason I wanted to hit some of those phases is because each major change was marked by these undeniable, miraculous, prophetic moments. And um, one of the incredible things about the prophetic is that when it, when it really happens, uh, it, it says in Corinthians that people's hearts are unveiled. They realize that God is truly among us. And, you know, they have these salvation moments. So that's my hope, you know, in, in telling these stories and, and however else God wants to, to use them. But um, I grew up in the kind of family and church atmosphere where it was normal to like pray for the sick and believe for miracles. And I have these, these moments where I'm, I've been marked by uh, the, the power of God. Like my, my sister one time, she had her, her ankle run over by a van and broken. And after they, they prayed for her ankle, it was miraculously restored. She was able to run around. And, and so that's, that's kind of how I grew up. And, and into high school, I was so just wild about Jesus that I wanted to make sure everyone Everyone knew, everyone had a moment to, to choose the Lord. And <laughs> I tell people that uh, this, is, this is actually true. My public high school had to create rules for, because of me, because of the, the wild ways that I would try to evangelize my school. <laughs> like this one time I, I put tracks in all the lockers that I had created with verses about what it means to get saved. And I, I slid them into every locker. And, Another time, me and my buddy, we were, we were planning on setting up these milk crates in the center of the school where all the hallways come together, and we were going to get there first thing in the morning, stand on these milk crates, and preach the gospel to all the students as they're coming in. And, and I was just, I was obsessed with even like the thought of maybe I could be martyred, you know, for Jesus. How awesome would that be? <laughs> that was just my mindset. Like everything was Jesus and the gospel. And and so this one morning when we were going to do that, we were going to preach the gospel. I was 16 at the time. I picked up my buddy to go to school early. And when he got in the car, I explained to him that um, the night before I had a dream from the Lord. And, and in the dream, we, we weren't preaching the gospel. We were anointing the lockers with oil and interceding for the, the souls of all the, the children in this school. And I said, I'm, I'm really sorry. I know that you're, we were planning on preaching, but I think today we're supposed to anoint the lockers with oil. And my buddy, his name is Dan. He got this big smile on his face, grabbed his backpack and pulled oil out. And he said, I had the same dream last night. And we both had bottles of canola oil from our mom's kitchen <laughs> that we decided we were gonna pray over and this would be our holy anointed canola oil <laughs> because we were kids and that's just the kind of faith we had. And so that day, instead of preaching the gospel, we anointed the lockers and prayed, interceded for the whole school. And, and um, we still got in trouble because you know, someone noticed like these shiny little crosses on the, on the lockers and we got Saturday detention where we had to clean the whole school because <laughs> we anointed the lockers with oil. Um, and then, you know, after, after high school, I, I knew there, there came this point where the Lord um, basically invited, borderline told me, you know, this is the ministry school that you're supposed to go to, the college you're supposed to go to. And so, and it was the summer like after enrollment had already, you know, pretty much ended and I didn't have any money. And so I filled out the application and I got accepted. I was like one of the last people to get accepted in the school, but I still had no money. And so I, this all happened in the span of a few days. So that week I went to church and a guy walked up to me who is a friend of my dad's and handed me a $500 check. And he just said, Hey, this is no strings attached. And then I, 
I heard the Lord say, go home and sell your motorcycle right now. And so I, I got in a car and I drove back to my house after thanking my friend for, for the money. I drove home, got on my motorcycle, drove it out into the front yard. And we lived on this country road where it's 55 mile an hour speed limit. And as I took the motorcycle out into the front yard, I put the, put the kickstand down and I was getting off and I was gonna go like make a, a sign with some wood saying for sale. And as I'm getting off the motorcycle, a pickup truck slams on its brakes and pulls into our driveway and he rolls down his window and says, hey, you selling that bike? And I said, yeah. He's like, how much? And I said, about 3,500 bucks. And <laughs> he said, do you mind if I test drive it? I'm like, no, go ahead. And so he drives it up and down the street and um, basically, you know, kind of haggles me down like three, 400 bucks. And I sell the motorcycle on the spot. He puts it in his truck and from in the, in the time span of 15 minutes, I, I got a $500 check and like $3,100, $3,200 from selling this motorcycle. And it was enough to pay for me to start the, next, the two semesters of, of ministry school. And so I move, you know, to the East Coast to go to this ministry school where the leaders were known to be incredibly prophetic, you know, had seen God move. I just wanted stories like theirs. I didn't care about the piece of paper I might end up if I graduate. I, I, I really wanted to be like these guys. And, and um, after that first year of ministry school, um, yeah, remember uh, Hurricane Katrina? That was the year that Hurricane that devastated New Orleans. I heard that there was a group of kids who were gonna get in a pickup truck and just drive there and see if we can see if they can be of help. And so I asked to go. And so the next thing, the very next morning, I'm in a pickup truck driving from Charlotte, North Carolina to New Orleans. And on the road, one, someone uh, makes a, a phone call, makes a connection, finds out that we might be able to get to this distribution tent that's getting set up. Um, it's a, a joint venture between like a church and the Red Cross. And so as we're getting closer to New Orleans, we're listening to Heidi Baker's testimony on CD. Heidi Baker, who's is this incredible um, missionary uh, mama of, of Africa, essentially, Mozambique. Um, and, but this is before it, she's famous. Like she, she's just, and it's so long ago, it's a CD, her testimony is on CD. And so we're, we're listening to Heidi Baker's testimony and I'm being just lambasted by the presence of God, just listening to this woman's story and heart for the orphans and miracles. And I say out loud in the truck, as we're heading to New Orleans, Lord, let me meet this woman. And I was just thinking someday, someday I'll meet Heidi Baker. And so <clears throat> we're, we're pulling into New Orleans and there are all these military checkpoints where they're directing people away from New Orleans. We get up to these checkpoints and we're a bunch of college students and, and we would talk to the, these um, military guys and say, we're, we're here to help. We're looking for a distribution tent. And they say, go on through, go on through. And we would see hundreds and hundreds of cars in front of us and behind us being detoured off a different direction where, where the one car being let through. And it happens three times. We get through these military checkpoints and now we're in the heart of New Orleans, like the devastation is insane. And we find, a, we find this distribution tent we're helping and um, I make friends with the guy who's leading it. And I noticed that there's a box of these little Bibles, these little Bibles. And um, I don't have my big Bible with me because we're out in the field like doing work. And so I asked the leader, hey, can I, can I have one of those? I'd love to just occasionally read scripture throughout the day. And he says, of course. And so I grabbed this one right off the top of the, the, the box of Bibles. And, and throughout the day, I would look at it and just, you know, just remind myself of the goodness of God and scripture and then just go back to handing out goods to people. And, and uh, I'm reading... Uh, once we get back to this, this church where we're sleeping, I have my full-size Bible, which has, has the Old Testament in it. This doesn't have the Old Testament in it. This is just a New Testament, Psalms and Proverbs. And I'm reading through um, the book of Joshua, and it gets to the scene where it says that the, the Reubenites and the Gadites didn't want to cross the Jordan with the rest of Israel. And, and it made the Lord and Moses angry. 
And I was like, huh, that's so interesting. They didn't want to cross the Jordan. I thought they all wanted to. They all wanted to get to the promised land, right? Like, why is it that these two tribes didn't want to? And um, this is during the summer after my first year of ministry school. And my second year of ministry school, the director of the school asked me if I would move to Dallas and help uh, a man named Jack Deere help, help him with the prophetic ministry at, at his church. And it was a great honor to be asked, but I didn't want to move. I loved my ministry school. I wanted to stay out there, but he wanted to get me a job at this church in the Dallas area. And so um, I went to bed that night and I was praying to God about what I'm supposed to do. Am I supposed to go to Dallas, leave this ministry school? I went to bed just like thinking about that question and I went into a dream. And in the dream, it was more of like a vision dream because a Bible fell from heaven, landed on its spine and fell open. And it was at the end of Hebrews and the beginning of James, which are consecutive books in the New Testament. But in between the two books was a blank page that was dancing like this. And it was almost like it was teasing me. And I woke up from the dream needing to know what, was, what the Lord was trying to say between the end of Hebrews and the beginning of James. And so I grabbed this tiny Bible that I was given the day before and I flipped open to the end of Hebrews and, and I read those verses and I read the first couple chapters of James and it's obviously all really good stuff, but nothing's like jumping out to me. And as I'm looking at the end of Hebrews, I notice these markings down in the binding on the last page of the book of Hebrews. And I, and, and I have to pull the binding apart because it's a brand new Bible. And I, and I spread these, these pages and it says NMV32. There's a misprint down in the binding of this one Bible. And I think Numbers chapter 32. And so I go to my full-size Bible that has the Old Testament and I go to Numbers chapter 32 and it's titled The Reubenites and the Gadites. Now I was reading from Joshua the day before about the Reubenites and the Gadites and now I'm in Numbers in a chapter titled The Reubenites and the Gadites. And I read in there that the reason the Reubenites and Gadites didn't want to cross the Jordan is because they had such great relationships that side of the Jordan. They had all these sheep, they were thriving and they didn't want to, they didn't think that the future unknown potential promises of God were better than what they already had. And the Lord spoke to me and, and said, I want you to cross the Mississippi, take land with your brothers. And the promise to the Reubenites and the Gadites is that after you take land with your brothers and sisters, you can either stay on that side or move back to where you were. But you need to cross the land on this, this, this journey, this conquest. And that was the Lord's word to me. And that's how I knew that I was to move from the Carolinas to Dallas. And, and, um, and so I had the confirmation that I needed for the next move of my life. And now we're still in New Orleans handing out you know, food after the Hurricane Katrina. And then we get invited of all places to Dallas um, by uh, some of Lou Engle's people. Lou Engle is having this 40 day fast and prayer for revival hosted at CFNI. And we got invited to come and help host it just through some ministry connections. And so, we continue our road trip <laughs> just keep because that's what college kids can do <laughs> you know we're just free so we we keep on driving and um this uh this young man named rick pino is leading worship this one night he's a recent graduate of cfni and no one knows of him yet he becomes kind of a, a famous you know incredible songwriter and worship leader but he's leading worship and the anointing is so thick in this library room at cfni and I'm, I'm up by this, the, the, the worship band there up front on this little stage and I'm on my knees and I have my Bible open on the floor and I'm weeping. And I hear someone next to me say, oh my gosh, that's Heidi Baker. And I look over at the door and this sweet, pretty, you know, woman has walked in and I, and I think to myself, that's not what I thought Heidi Baker would look like. And then I went right back to worshiping. And then the Lord said, you asked to meet her. 
didn't you? And I, then I thought, oh my gosh, it's, it's been like just a few days since I prayed that prayer. And Heidi Baker walks in with Lou Engel and someone else and looks around the room. And the first thing she does is she walks straight to me. And I'm just, I have my face in my Bible. And Heidi lays on top of me and wraps her arms around my belly like a mom and begins to whisper my prophetic destiny and identity into my ear as I am weeping into my Bible. And she, she says, essentially, I was sent here for you. I'm no one, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm just the Lord's son. This, I know that makes me sound like something, but this is just exactly what has happened. And I'm, I'm, it's, there are two moments in my life when the presence of God was so thick on me that I had to ask him to stop because I felt like I was going to die, and that was one of them. Yeah, so that moment was so intense that I, I felt like I needed God to stay his hand so that I didn't, like, um, evaporate. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so this, this Bible I've, I've kept for 20 years because it's just this cool, physical reminder and evidence that God actually speaks. And when I discovered this, um, this typo down, uh, this misprint down in the binding of this one Bible, I went back to the box of Bibles to see if other Bibles had the same misprint and they didn't. I flipped through dozens. This was the only one that has NMV 3.2. And it's the one that I grabbed, and it's the one that the Lord spoke to me through in a dream that led me to the answer to know where the, basically the next several decades of my life would be spent, because I've, I've put down roots in Dallas and raising my family here. And even though I, we, it's still so important to um, be led by the Spirit on a day-to-day -day basis, I can't say enough about how important it is to put down roots when you know that you're supposed to. And, and that's, um, it's always fun to pull this Bible out and show it to like my students or, or to the church as um, just another undeniable moment when I know God spoke. Probably the most important uh, deliverance in my life or the thing that I've needed to get freed of is um, doing something great for God. Because uh, I was always trained to think, go, you know, do great things for God and save the lost and do miracles. And I read books about the great men and great things that they did. And then I, I realized that the people who did the greatest things for God in Scripture didn't know that they were doing great things for God while they were doing great things for God. They were living their lives and following their passion and following the wind of the Spirit. And David didn't wake up one day and, and think, I'm going to write a banger worship song for Jesus today. He just woke up this one day oppressed in his heart and got honest with God and said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? not knowing that one day Christ himself would be hanging on the cross singing David's worship song. Um, of course, we know that he wasn't forsaken. The end of that psalm actually says, you've not hidden your face from him. Um, and, you know, Jacob knew that he had to dig a well, not knowing that one day Christ himself would sit on it and save the Samaritan woman who would save her whole city. Uh, he didn't know he was doing something great for God. He woke up and followed his heart that day and and um, you know or Mary when she poured out her perfume she didn't think I'm going to make Jesus smell good for the grave she thought how can I love on Jesus extravagantly today what if what if this is my last moment with them and looked around and aha I'm gonna pour that out and pours it out not knowing that Jesus would actually say I'm, I'm gonna smell like this forever and when you smell the fragrance of the Lord show up in her room it's Mary's perfume and so God is a better leader than I am a follower. And when I just submit to, to being loved unconditionally by him and live uh, a life within his affection and great things happen, I get to do something great with God every day. Instead of trying to do great things for God, I'm doing great things with God.